say lacquer. Friends, we're going to start um, with a with a usual centering exercise. Um, we're starting to shift it towards a space where we actually have a, have a confession of guilt um, with the idea, with the knowledge that, that confessing our guilt, putting it on the table, isn't just a way in which we remind ourselves of our own brokenness, our own fallibility, the inherent wrongness and actually in the current, current environment violence that resides within us, um, but also as a reminder that we have been liberated from that. We have been saved. We have already been forgiven for what we have done what we still do, and what we are yet to do. So if it helps you to focus, you can close your eyes at this moment in time. Sit as comfortably as possible. Elizri had the suggestion of maybe lying down, if you want to lie down. So I want to put that forward as an option as well. Everyone is fine with sitting. Okay, nice. Um, And we just start by focusing on the breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Not that quick though, but breathe in, <laughs> breathe out. Now I'm, I'm, I'm doing it that way because part of the focus is becoming aware of the rhythm. So breathe in. Feel the lungs filling up, feel the body expanding. You feel bigger. You are bigger. And breathe out, the air rushing away, flowing out of the mouth or the nose. Lungs collapsing, body becoming smaller. Breathe in, bigger. Breathe out, smaller. In. And out. And while you're in this space, aware of the rhythm, aware of the breath, go back to Monday past. Go back to when you woke up that morning for the first time, when you took a breath again. And reflect through Monday past. What happened? Where were you? What did you see? What did you do? What did you say? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, this morning. And as you're remembering this past week, as you're maybe even reliving this past week, What did you do? What did you say? Where did you go that was wrong? Where did you maybe hurt someone? Where did you possibly hurt yourself? Where did you intentionally choose to forget God, to leave him behind because you know what you are about to do is something you do not want him to see? Where were you overwhelmed with guilt? Where were you overwhelmed with anger, with wrath, with hate, with apathy? Where did you lie? When were you dishonest? Bring it up, hold it, look at it. Try and relive what you felt then. And as you're holding it, as you are looking at it, put it down. Concretely put it down on the floor. We say it so often, friends, so, so often, God is with us. We've even got a name for that, Emmanuel, God with us. It's one of our core convictions. Wherever I am, God is there. Whatever I do, God is there. Whatever I'm saying, God is speaking with me. Nowhere 
Nowhere in this creation is there a space where God is not present. And the presence of God makes a space holy. In other words, even in our most darkest of spaces, even when we are lying, even when we are hurting, even when we are even killing, God is there. And he's not there judging. He's not there condemning. He's not there looking over our shoulder and telling us, listen here, you've got now three wrong marks and you get the next one and you're going straight to this fire they speak about. That's not the way in which he is there. That's not the reason why he is present. Always. He's there because he loves He's there because he has forgiven. He is there because he was willing to sacrifice everything on two pieces of wood. We confess our guilt, friends. We confess this which we call sin. We bring it to the light. We remind ourselves thereof so that we can be once again reminded of the reality and the truth that this sin This wrongness, this darkness that's in each and every one of us, this does not define us. Your pain is severe, is see. What you have done is not who you are. Who you have hurt is not who you are. Who you are, who we are, is good, is beautiful. Is holy because, as we reminded each other a bit earlier, there's no space in this creation where the Creator is not present. And every space where the Creator is present is a holy space. Even those dark spaces within us. God is there. That is holy. We are holy. And that's why we sing. That's why we worship. That's why we say thank you through music. Because this unconditional presence, unconditional love, this unconditional nature of who and what God is, is the greatest gift. The greatest gift. Our struggle is to truly accept that. To truly take that gift. And only say, thank you, Lord. And stop saying, I'm so undeserving thereof. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you to Helios for the effort they put into practice. And friends, worship with that spirit. That we're saying thank you. We're celebrating this holy life we live each and every day. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 So, uh, friends, this evening... We're going to be speaking on removing the veil. Our text is specifically 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 up until verse 18. If you've got a Bible, feel more than welcome and more than free to open up your own Bible. If you do not have a Bible, the words will be appearing there on the screen. So you can still read with. I myself am also going to be reading off of the screen. Before we turn, turn to our scripture reading for this evening, some of you... Maybe much of this, others hopefully not. Uh, but I just want to once again explain briefly for two minutes why for me personally it's quite important that we pray before we read Bible. And specifically we, we pray for certain things before we read. The reality is as humans, as people, as individuals. Ne? Ne? As humans, as people, as individuals. Ne? Am I wrong if I say that? As humans, as people, as individuals. I just, I just want to wake you up a bit. As humans, as people, as individuals, we've got our own specific desires. No? Some of us maybe want a boyfriend. Machit. No? Okay, not. Some of us don't want a boyfriend. Machit doesn't. Some of us want a very nice job. Some of us want to get far in life. Some of us just want to be comfortable, build our little white picket fence, get two and a half dogs and maybe three and a half children, work up until retirement, and then we die. That's what some of us want. No, let's be honest. Not all of us have these big, grandiose desires and dreams. Some of us just want to be comfortable. 
We've got our, all got our own desires, our own objectives, our own goals to which we are working. The reality is, oftentimes we can conflate, in other words, we can abuse, distort, and warp that which we are reading so that it suits our ideals, so that it justifies what we want out of life. Our own country's history shows us very well our own church, Kopanong. Some of you may not know we are part of the Dutch Reformed family. Our own church so shows us how easy it is to take this wonderful message written in between those pages and use that to validate something that is actually horrid, something that's actually atrocious, something that's actually the opposite of God's will. So, why we pray before we read the Bible is as far as possible to try and undercut that, try and circumvent that. I don't think it's possible to truly circumvent it, but just to, to, to make it a bit less. In other words, we ask that our own voices, our own desires, our own goals, our own objectives become less, become smaller, maybe even fade away. So that that which God is trying to tell us, that which God is trying to show us is more clear. We ask that we ourselves, in ourselves, die a little bit. So that there is more presence, more space for God to be there. So, all the persons and the people and the individuals, do you agree with that? Nice. Let's pray. A very simple prayer. You can follow if you want to. We basically ask, Lord, that you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear what it is that you want to show us, what it is that you want to tell us this evening. Help that our own selves, the ayah, our own desires, goals, and objectives become less, start fading away, maybe even die. So that your life, your presence, your truth, your beauty becomes a bit more clear. We know that you will help us in this. Help that we are willing to do that. Amen. We read together 2 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 12 up until verse 18. It reads as follows. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. We read up until there. We can move on. Come in. Context. 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 What do we mean by that? Does anyone have a Bible I can borrow? Oh, thank you, Ma. We have the privilege of having this book in its entirety, having received this book in its entirety. The reality is this book is more of a library than it is a single book. And each and every book within this library was written in a specific time and a specific place to address a specific question. We forget that. We really do. I think oftentimes we can live under the illusion that this just fell in its cohesive hole out of the air and dropped down. There we go. There we have it. This is not true. That's it. Thank you for, for borrowing that. Um, that's not true. Reality is, as I said, every section, every piece was written for a specific 
question. Our question then becomes 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 12 up until 18. What was the situation within which it was written? What was the question it was trying to address? What was the issue it was possibly trying to alleviate? And we start with the city of Corinth and then we can move on. Thank you, Carmi. So I, I, I tried my very most utter best to put in a, a map of the world. But it's a bit small and it's a bit difficult and I really need to reach it because I really need to show you something. So I'm going to grab this stock. So the city of Corinth. Who knows where the city of Corinth was? I'm doing this. I'm doing this because this morning I also preached at another congregation in Afrikaans. And then this, this afternoon I had the privilege of having a coffee with someone. And, and they were there this morning and they told me, don't you want to consider having a map? Because you tried to explain where Corinth is, but we did not really understand where it is. So now I'm going to show you. Does anyone have any idea where it is, more or less? No. Okay, Corinth. Yo. Help me. Okay, we're going to work with the shadow. So the top point of that shadow. Corinth is more or less there. <laughs> ne? Colleague, am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> I'm maybe a bit nervous here. Okay, let's... Uh, so Corinth is more or less there. Or there, somewhere there. <laughs> <laughs> no, Corinth, Corinth is more or less there. The reason why I'm, why I'm, why I'm highlighting this, why I'm showing it to you, um, because it's quite... Um, it's important for us to know where Corinth was specifically in the ancient world. So remember, we're working 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. The reality was Roman Empire, most of the Mediterranean Sea and the southern parts of Europe, the largest part of France as well, um, all across up until Greece and, and most of Turkey, down Middle East, basically a whole ring around the Mediterranean Sea. That was the Roman Empire. That was their space, their place. They ruled. They were the big men there. The empire itself had a lot of trade with the eastern eastern world. India itself was also a thing. It was an extremely developed world, actually. China, even more. China was a massive empire that had existed at that stage 2,000 years ago that had already existed for, and I may be wrong, but I think it's 1,500 to 2,000 years already 2,000 years old. So it's these massive countries, these massive empires trading with one another. They did not have airplanes. Um, they had ships, but not in the way in which we have it. So most of the trade worked through land. So they tried to identify trade routes that were effective, cost effective. So if we look there, what is the quickest route going from China to Europe? Stack. It's a line. It's right through that region where we identified where Corinth is, more or less. Right through that region. I'm telling this because the city of Corinth was a place, was a center of trade. It was one of the biggest trade cities of its day, which meant people from right across the globe coming together, ideas from right across the globe coming together, ideas planted and spreading from there right across the globe. Paul, who wrote Corinthians, was extremely intentional in how he chose cities, how he chose spaces where he went to go mission. I think we, we can be under the impression that Paul was converted, met Jesus, la di da, and now I'm just going to go into the world and find a place to preach this message, and then just naturally and organically, Christianity spread right across the world. Yes, true, partly. Other side, very strategic, very intentional. All of the seven first congregations, Corinth, Thessalonica, Thessalonica, Thessaloni, we've got Thessaloni as a suggestion, Thessaloni, Ephesus, etc., etc. All of those cities were trade hubs of their day. All of those cities were the capital cities of their immediate region. All of those cities were extremely important cities. All of those cities were intentionally chosen by Paul 
to go to because Paul knew if he planted a seed in this city, in this space, the probability is quite big that from this one city it would spread right across the globe because why? That city was standing within a network where people are constantly moving through. First point, Corinth. This is where the community is. This is where the congregation is. A multicultural City that is just very dynamic and very on the go, and people tend to be temporary inhabitants thereof. Second part, and I think, yes, Carmi, if you can go back now, that will maybe help me, different approaches. Two-thirds, three-quarts of the New Testament is Paul's writing. Most of the pastoral letters, Romans, Corinthians, etc., etc., were written by Paul. Paul wasn't the only Christian missionary, and Paul's approach to Christianity wasn't the only one. There were different ideas, different ways in which Christianity should be done already 2,000 years ago. Think, think of our reality today. We're in Bloemfontein, there's CRC doing their own thing, Doxa Deo doing a different thing, Baptista doing a different thing, Dutch from Church in Africa doing a different thing, Fiechika doing a different thing, Presbyterians, Anglicans, etc. The list goes on and on and on and on. We're used to the reality of different ways that we do the faith, different churches. Roy Rebokram, Roy Rebokram, Roy Rebokram. Different ways <laughs> that we do the faith. I think oftentimes we think that 2,000 years ago they were a cohesive whole. Everyone felt the same, everyone thought the same, everyone believed the same. And that which we read in the New Testament is that original way in which we, they believed. That's not true. That which we read in the New Testament is a way of doing the faith that won, if I can put it in, in, in quotation marks. That's the way that became dominant through the years. It wasn't dominant from the beginning and it wasn't the only one from the beginning. What's the core of Paul's message? Grace, grace alone, sola gratia. What, what we also believe, what we testify. Nothing I can do, nothing I can say, nothing I can give away can make that God gives more of his grace to me, that grace has already been received. That was Paul's theology, Paul's message to a large part. That's what we believe today. And please bear with me, friends. It's going to make sense why I'm, why I'm taking such a roundabout route now. It's what we believe today. It was not the only one. He wasn't the only missionary. He wasn't the only person going to, to cities and planting Christianity. A lot of people and a lot of different things, different ways of doing it. Then we come to the congregation, the church of Corinth itself. So all of things, all of these things I'm mentioning because that is what this congregation is experiencing. That is what this church of Corinth to whom the letter was addressed is experiencing, is confronted with. Paul came, planted the church, grace alone, that's the truth, that's the method. Oh, Gerard Meyer. <sighs> that's the truth, that's the message. Paul goes away to Ephesus or Thessalonica or whichever city. Someone else comes along. We can move on to the next night, so long, thank you. Someone else comes along. They put down on the table. Yes, Jesus was born. Yes, he was God. Yes, he was tortured. Yes, he died on the cross. Yes, he rose up on the third day. Yes, he has forgiven your sins and your brokenness. But, but, in order for you to receive this forgiveness, in order for you to receive this salvation, you must do one, two, and three. In the text we read um, Paul referring to the Old Covenant, another way of saying the Old Testament, also referring to those who read Moses or when Moses is read, which um, is the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, um, avail the sense, a veil covers. I'll get to that now. Ministry of law, ministry of death, law, death, ministry of the spirit. Paul came initially 
put down. Grace alone. Nothing you do. Nothing you say. Nowhere you may find yourself will mean that you receive more grace. This grace has already been given. Everyone gets it regardless of who and what they are. Yo, this morning I used the lack example, so I'm going to use it again. Kami, can you pour me a cup of water? Thank you, sister. Because, friends, that's the reality. That's the way in which we also often still think today. We confess with our mouths in church to one another. No, listen, I know. I know. Salvation, I have already received it. I know nothing I can do will make that I get more of it. I know nowhere I might go will make that I get more of it. I know nothing I can give up will make that I get more of it. But, thank you, Peter. What happens when someone that stinks, someone that's dirty, someone that's ugly walks through our church doors? Maybe not even such an extreme example. What happens when someone enters that believes in a different way that we do? What do we ourselves do? Ian, can you come to the front, please? Sorry, Bruno. You can literally just stand there. Just stand there. 30 years ago, looking like this, do you think you most probably would have been allowed into a church? No. <laughs> you can go sit. I'm not, I'm not putting you on the spot, Ian, and, and, and we're not using an extreme, I mean, just quickly just look around, friends. A lot of us are dressed very casual and very rustic, and that, that's amazing, actually. That's an expression of what we believe. But 30 years ago, there were parameters in place. There were rules, there were steps. One step, two step, three steps that had to be gone through before you can experience Christ's grace, Christ's forgiveness. Christ's salvation, before you were allowed to partake of the communion, before you were allowed to be baptized. And we also think in that way still today. Am I still going to go to heaven if I've never been baptized? No, so maybe I should get baptized. Am I still going to go to heaven if I get baptized the second time? No. So maybe just stay with my initial baptism. Am I still going to go to heaven if I don't read my Bible every day? If I don't pray every day? No, probably not. So let's read our Bible every day. Let's pray every day. Am I still going to go to heaven if I do not love my neighbor? Most probably not. So let me try and love my neighbor. Am I still going to receive grace, salvation, if I don't try and love my enemy at least? No. So let me try and love my enemy. Words we are used to hearing, words we ourselves say so often, but words that are actually also a form of a law, a form of a step that needs to be taken before that salvation is received, friends. And this was the thing that drove Paul up against the wall. He could not understand how we so easily twist this initial truth. How we are so quick to put in parameters as to how you can receive grace. How we find such subtle and innovative ways that we try and validate the ways in which we can be saved. Paul was flabbergasted, astounded that we cannot grasp, cannot understand, cannot just accept that all God is doing is saying, I love you, I love you, I'm going to continue loving you. Nothing you will do will ever stop me loving you. That's all. It's literally all. I think why it's so difficult for us is because we are so used to giving when we receive or receive, you are giving when we receive or giving in order to receive. In all facets, not just going into the shop, paying an amount of money so I can take the product out, but even in our most intimate relationships. 
Oftentimes, what's one of the biggest frustrations we have in friendships, in marriages one day, with our children, with our brothers and our sisters, with our fathers and our mothers? You do not appreciate me. Why do you not see what I'm doing for you? Why do you not acknowledge the sacrifices I make to keep this relationship in place? That's a trade, friends. That's a trade. He said, so I am willing. I'm willing to sacrifice for you. But the least you can do is tell me thank you. The least you can do is give me a thank you. So do you understand how difficult it is for us? Like really, we struggle. And then the Lord comes along and he's just like, hey, there you go. Take it. And we're like, yet and here. <laughs> Can't I do this first? Then I feel more deserving thereof. That's what Paul's referring to. Because that's what the old covenant is steeped in. To a large extent, that's what the Old Testament is steeped in. And the moment, the moment we turn that way, the moment we start thinking that way, a veil descends and our whole understanding of who and what God is changes. Fundamentally, I would even put forth it warps. It becomes distorted. That was Paul's struggle. That was Paul's message in this text. That was the issue Paul was trying to address towards this early church in Corinth. The idea that grace costs us something. The idea that there's certain laws, certain routines, certain mannerisms, things I can do in my life which will make me more deserving of grace, which will make the Lord more willing to give me grace. That idea, that way of doing faith, Paul equates to death. Death. And why? Why such an extreme likeness? Why such an extreme comparison? Because what is left unsaid? What is left unsaid? What is left unsaid when we're in the mindset that I need to read my Bible and pray every day so I can receive salvation? I need to do good things to those around me so that I can receive salvation, be a better Christian. I need to work on my self-introspection so I can be a better Christian receive salvation. What is left unsaid in that? What happens when I do not receive salvation? Where do I end up, Elizabeth, when I do not receive salvation? How? Fire. Let's be honest with one another, friends. Let's really, really, really quickly be honest. How many times has the motivator for you to do the good and Christian thing been the fear of judgment, of condemnation, of everlasting pain? Some way it's true. In our deepest, deepest, oh, deepest and most cynical, Cynic, cynistic, cynical. In our deepest and our most cynical, in my deepest and most cynical spaces, I'm quite convicted that actually when you let everything fall away, let it all strip down at the heart of why most of us believe or confess we believe is because even if this thing is not true, at least all my bases are covered. I can be wrong, but if I'm wrong in this direction, at least I won't go to hell. And what is that idea of hell, actually? 
It's a way of working through fear, a way of working through violence, a way of working through dominance and ensuring, actually forcing you to do the Christian thing. It's a way of using power and might to put down the right way of doing life. It's a violent method. And I would just like to think, try to remember, here brother, or the brother that hung here, what happened each and every time in the stories we read, each and every time he encountered violence. He experienced violence. What did he do? One of the best examples for me is Jesus, 12 disciples, 11 disciples. Judas has gone away to fetch the Roman soldiers. He stole the Roman soldiers through a kiss, one of the most intimate gestures that you can show someone through a kiss. I am going to identify who the one is that you need to catch and torture and kill. He does that, kisses Jesus on the cheek. The Roman soldiers come in to capture him. Peter, standing there, it's just like, no, 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 no. No, 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 this is not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it. I'm going to protect my Lord. I'm going to protect my Messiah. He takes out his sword. He attacks one of the soldiers, cuts off his ear. And what does Jesus do? He's not, thank you that you protected me. He berates Paul. He gets angry at Paul. It's like walking down the street. Walking down the street. Someone comes along, mugs me. I lie down there on the ground. They take my phone. They run away. 500 meters down the road, someone else saw what's happening. They stop this guy, moves him, takes my phone, brings it back to me. And my reaction is, why did you hit that guy? You shouldn't have hit him. That's precisely what happened, friends. So Peter is in the space where he feels, I'm protecting that which I love. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to even die for that which I love. I'm willing to do violence for that which I love. And for me, that's the key. Jesus was just violence never. Never, never, never. Haven't you heard one single thing I've been telling you these past three years? Violence never. It's not the last option. It's not even an option. It isn't, friends. The ministry of, of the law, the idea that through doing certain things we can receive grace, we can receive salvation, is a ministry that's only kept in place or mostly kept in place through the underlying and unsaid idea of everlasting death and torment within hell. It's an inherently violent way of understanding the faith. It's not a ministry of life. It's not a ministry of rejuvenation, of healing, of restoration. It's a ministry of death. And we're susceptible to it. Let's not forget that. Extremely, extremely susceptible to it. And it's subtle, friends. It's as subtle as being convicted that unless I read my Bible each and every day, I won't go to heaven. It's as subtle as that. Grace is unconditional. Onvoorwaardelijk. Christ did not die on the cross in order to tell us, do this and this and this and then I will love you. Then my sacrifice was worth it. He died there because he wanted to die there. He loves because he wants to love. He gives because he will never stop giving. 
I'm going to end off with my example key. Nina. To summarize, to bring it om het vast te vat, vrienden. Nee, een opzomming. I'm going to start finishing up now. In 20 minutes time, I'm still be finishing up. Nina, you can come to the floor. I'm just filling the empty space now. Um, <laughs> I like to think that what happened 2,000 years ago, imagine this glass of water is grace. Genade. Nee? And I think water is quite fitting. Without water, no life would exist nowhere, to our knowledge at least. Nowhere. Grace is also quite an important part, an essential part of living a holistically healthy life. So, this glass of water. 2,000 years ago, grace. Jesus comes down and he's like, here we go, Nina. And Nina takes. And Nina drinks. And Nina's thirst is alleviated. What we do in our own way, we're like, here's the grace. Here's Nina. Nina, please take it. No, quickly wait. What did you do yesterday? Did you read your Bible today? <laughs> quickly go read your Bible. Quickly go, go. You can, you can go sit now, man. Go read your Bible. Reads the Bible, comes back. Here's your grace. We've got the arrogance. And that's what it is, friends. We've got the arrogance to think we can play gatekeepers to God's grace. That we can decide who walks into the doors. That we can decide whose life is renewed. That we can decide who is deserving of salvation. We've got that arrogance, not only towards others, but that arrogance towards ourselves. Because we do not understand, we cannot understand how this thing can be unconditional. Just that. Through grace alone, nothing else is needed. And nothing will make that you get more of it. And even more, friends. God didn't just come and put the grace down there. And he's like, okay, Ian, now you must just stand up and go fetch your grace. He, not really. <laughs> he didn't do that. Even more amazingly, God did this. He said, here's the grace. Ian, just take. Just take. He comes to us with it. He doesn't put it there far away. He doesn't tell us, walk this whole road and then you will attain it. Then you will achieve it. He's like, I'm giving this to you and I'm even bringing it to you. And then often, what do we do? Put our hands in our pockets and say, Lord, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow I'll be better. Maybe tomorrow I'll be able to just extend my hand. May we start getting better at just taking that which is given to us, at just taking that which is brought to our very feet. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, short, quick, to the point, we ask forgiveness that oftentimes we do not accept your grace. We ask forgiveness for those times that we do not allow others to receive your grace. 
But even more than that, we ask forgiveness that we often have the arrogance to believe we are able to stop your grace. Thank you. Thank you that regardless of our arrogance, regardless of our unwillingness, regardless of our fallibility and humanness, you keep on standing right in front of us with the grace extended. Amen. Last week and Thursday, war broke out uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Um, I'm mentioning this because I think some of us do not realize how precarious the situation is, how hectic it is, how when we are speaking about end of days, we're not exaggerating currently. Um, so the issue is Russia, Ukraine. Russia has nuclear weapons. Ukraine does not have nuclear weapons. Ukraine has various ties, no alliances, but various ties to most of the Western world. The Western world has got nuclear weapons. Five minutes before our services started, Vladimir Putin put what they call the deterrent forces in Russia on high alert. Underneath the deterrent forces are their nuclear weapons, which means literally in the eye blink, he can decide, let's go, we're launching. And if he does that, the rest of the world reacts. In Isaiah 4, I think, verse 2, we read, sorry, Carmen, well-known verse, extremely so. Um, some of you may know, it will appear now, but it's a well-known one where the swords will be turned into plowshares, um, their weapons will be broken down, war will no longer be a thing, nations will not train their people to enter into war. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they for nor will they train for war any more. Friends, this is the world we are working towards. This is the world we believe in. This is the world Christ came and put down 2,000 years ago. This is the world for which he sacrificed everything. We cannot choose violence. We may never choose violence. We cannot condone violence. We cannot be entertained by violence. One of, the, one of the things that made, gave me a fright this past week is how interesting the war is to me. How I click on almost every article about it. How I'm quite keen to find out, okay, what happened next? And what city are they now? How far along are they in the invasion? How good is Ukraine at defending their nation? How many people have they killed? How, how much have they ensured they have not been conquered? And what I just realized in that process is that within me there's still this darkness that likes violence this darkness that's excited by violence this darkness that may even be willing to participate in violence that must die because until that thing dies this reality that we're seeing in the news currently will always, always be present. And friends, my blessing this evening is precisely that. May the good Lord continue helping us in killing this violent darkness in all of our hearts. May you be blessed. Amen.